Parker for being here. They've been hanging out for a few weeks, and uh, I know they've been ministering to everyone there around, and they've been part of different things. This is their, their church family, and we're thankful for how they minister. The love of the Lord Jesus Christ there. Uh, they've been missionaries for many, many years. It's just that God changed their direction and their their uh, address and sent them to the Dominican Republic a few months ago and they're home for a little while. Lee has been preaching in Harrisonville and uh, at a conference that just finished up. And, uh, and so we have an additional missionary just hanging out here, uh, just happened to be driving by and didn't have anywhere to go, so he decided to come to church here. And, and I like that. That's pretty good that he came to, to stop in here. He mentioned something, and uh, um, I'll let him mention it if God has him. But uh, Dan, Del- Dan Jelowick and Janice have been uh, friends of mine and Cheryl's and our family for decades, three decades, 30 years plus. And uh, Dan's been a missionary over in Africa and Zambia and Chapata for what, 15? Eight? 15 sounds much better. We're going to go with 15. Eight years. And uh, children all grown up. What happened? How did it happen so fast? But Dan is uh, out here in this area as part of the conference over in Heartland in Harrisonville. And uh, Randy let me know he'd be around. Would we love to have him pop in and share a little word? So uh, I... To me, any time that we can connect and having a connecting piece, have a missionary in front of you, we're going to have Lee come speak to us and share some of the field work uh, here before they return back to the Dominican. And any time missionaries around that we support, we'd love to have them up in front of you so you can have a fresh view and a fresh sense of where they're at and to pray in a more fervent way and maybe something in more particular. So this morning, before we get into the Word a little bit, uh, let me introduce to you, again, because he has been here a few times, Dan Jelowick. Come and speak to us for a few minutes. Thank you, Dan. It is such a blessing to be here, um, to see Brownie again. You know, what, what God has been doing is just so, so amazing, and all credit and glory goes to him. And through our, our walk and our testimony, God has been always asking us to do much more than we ever thought we could do. And um, it, it, it doesn't mean that you can do it and you can do it successful the first time. But God just says, you know what, go. Trust me. And that's what we've done. Um, I had gone in 2005 was the first time to Zambia. And that was a one-time trip for me. I had resigned as a manager years before. I felt the Lord just leading me to give all the manager uh, stuff up, the the, uh, bonuses and all of that. And I didn't know why, because we began to just struggle financially. But God was building our trust. And when I was asked to go to Zambia in 2005, I sat in a meeting and said, nope, I can't do that. I don't have the money. I can't get the time off, and I can't preach like that. Well, God, I know you can, but I can't. So I'll say yes, I'll let you close the door, and we'll be good. And he kept the door open, and he kept it open and kept it open. And we went in 2000, I went in 2005, like I said, a one-time trip. And God absolutely clearly spoke to me. I remember talking to (laughs) Brother uh, Bonner uh, during that trip, and he was talking about his call and his testimony and, and just different people's call. And I said, that's never happened to me. Nope, God's never spoken to me like that. God will never speak to me like that. I'm just sure, because the scripture has never spoken to me like that. Well, by the end of that trip, God was very, very clear. The last Sunday, which is Easter Sunday, there were two of us that were to preach. But there was only one one service, so one of us had to preach. We said we would pray together, and we would we would know before that who was going to preach. Well, me and my partner, Tom Street, we prayed together. We, I prayed, Jehovah God, you give us all the answers that we need. Please speak to us and show us who should preach. He prayed. We finished. He says, it's clear that he should pray. I said, okay, why? He says, he prepared a message on Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides. I said, okay. I said, I'll go and I'll just, I'll observe. Well, on the way out there, I said, 
I can't just sit. I need to be involved somehow. He said, why don't I act out the part of Isaac? So I came in with a bundle of wood on, on my shoulders, and you can hear everyone. <gasps> they were getting the visual of it. They were being brought into the story. And as Abraham was asking Isaac to get on the altar, I knelt down next to the altar. And I was going to pray before Isaac got on the altar. And while I was there, it was clear. God said, this is what I want you to do. And I got up, I laid on that altar, and I said, I don't know what you're talking about, God. And before that week was over, it was clear. God says, this is where I want you to be. And that began a trip, a long journey of patience and preparation. And I felt like, I want to be there now. God says, patience. I says, I want to go. I can do it now. Pastor Gray says, Bible Institute. I said, that's four years. He said, patience. And I've watched God prepare. If you're anxious to do something for God, do what he's called you to do right then and there. Preparation is ministry. From that, God has planted eight churches that we work with there. And now we're seeing the teenagers grow up and they're teaching Bible studies. And God continues to grow. Just before I came back in October, uh, we had just finished building our, our second church building out there at Chicoka. They named it for a river that goes through there. And they said the river, or the name Chicoka means it gives life to everything that comes by. And I thought, man, that's good. God is working in their hearts, and they know the value of the Word of God. And the week before I came back, I had the blessing of, one, having our first baptism there. We had 54 people that got baptized there, and we were blessed with that, and we shared the Lord's Supper, and now I'm, I'm getting updates every week, watching how they're growing and continue to grow. So we're going back uh, in uh, a week from Tuesday, back to Zambia. So a couple prayer requests, please. Uh, pray that, obviously, our transition uh, there goes well. Saying goodbye to family, our children, grandchildren, uh, and that as we get there, God truly directs our path. We don't want to get back into the same routine. If God has some different plan, we want to be walking in his spirit and know that he's leading us there. So whatever uh, God's plans are, we pray that we would be receptive to it. Um, I was once challenged by this, that you're either a mission field or you're a missionary. And I sat there and I was just struck and I said, well, God, I'm saved, but I'm not a missionary. And he said, yes, you are. Wherever I've planted you, make sure you grow. And let me leave you with this last thing. If the missionaries had to stay on the field because of your prayers only, would they still be able to remain on the field? Don't take prayer lightly. It is what moves the hand of God. It is what he calls the angels down to answer to prayer. Please continue to pray for us. In the last note, we have many spiritual fathers and Brownie is one of ours. As he said, we've, we've known each other for years. And shortly after we were married, um, we had our first, hosted our first Bible study in our house. And Brownie was the teacher of it. And one of the first lessons was how to give your testimony. And I remember, uh, he says, you know, write out your notes. And I wrote them out. And that next week, we gave the testimony. And I literally, I just, I read the notes. It was very perfunctory. I just, that's what I, that's, and he said, uh, listen, um, I think he even put his arm around me. He says, I just want you to go. I want you to take this this week. And I want you to pray over it. I want you to ask God, what has he really done in your life? And I changed a few words. I changed a few sentences. But when I got up the next week, it just kept ringing. What has God done for you? I, st I stood to give my testimony. I could barely speak when I realized how God loved me and saved me and how he has transformed my life, I am so, so grateful for that. God just wants a willing heart. God gives us everything we need if we're just willing to follow him. Brownie, thank you for investing in us. Bobby, thank you for investing in me. We thank you for your prayers and your support. Please.
continue to keep praying that God would do great things, for he is worthy. Amen. vessels that are also prepared as i heard from brother dan that's a huge element go to he uh excuse me i got hebrews in my notes but we won't probably get there galatians chapter number three please with me galatians chapter number three we're going to finish out chapter number three and uh and head into four next week and uh, we're moving along in our study I think I got this thing corrected for a second there, B. We'll see how that goes. We're going to grab around verse number 15. I might even uh, mention verse number 14 from last week's message, but um, let me see. I'll give it one more try. Okay. You know what? We're no longer using that. There you go. There we go. We're relying solely on you. There's a statement up up on the screen about a promise. A promise is a binding declaration. And it's made in a way that says you've got to do something. And the person that you make that promise to or the entity, whatever it is that you do, you have to come through because it's a declaration of doing something or give something for another's benefit. People say when they um, go through the vows for a wedding, for uh, the marriage ceremony, and you go through those vows, and you say, I do, and I do, it's, it's a covenant, it's a promise. When you put on a, a wedding ring, it doesn't mean only because I have the wedding ring on, I'm married, but what the wedding ring does say is, it's representative of the promise I made, the vow that I made, the covenant that I made with the Lord and with you, and I want to fulfill it for the rest of my life. That's the way God puts things into his creation and for his glory. Marriage is big to God. And so he says, you promise, you make that declaration, it's a binding thing, you're bound by it, and it's significant because This message today talks about God's promise. And in this study in the book of Galatians, we talk about covenant, we talk about promise, we talk about faith, a lot of that. And we have to be reminded, as from last week's message when we were looking at Father Abraham and and looking at how God counted his faith for righteousness and he imputed his righteousness, God's righteousness upon him, for his faith. So, what's this law about? Cursed is the law. So, does that mean that the law is useless? Well, let's hang on today. We're going to answer that question because the law is important to God. It's just that it's for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's God's promise that he's delivered through the Lord Jesus Christ. And as those that got saved in the Old Testament are looking forward to the cross one day and they're never going to see it because they're hearing of it and the prophecy of it. But we, today, we look back to the cross and we say, hallelujah, thank you, Lord God, for coming through in your covenant and your promise. So, as I say about Abraham and mention him, God's promise to Abraham said this. He declared, it's a promise, he declared it, he said, All the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Has God ever made a promise that he didn't keep? Absolutely not. God declared that Abraham would be the father of all nations. All the nations of the earth then shall be blessed by him, blessed in him. It says that in Genesis chapter number 18, in case you're wondering where that is, in 1818, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, comma, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? Question mark. Also in Genesis 12, we're reminded in verse 2, and when God separated and called him out, he said, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. So God's promise to Abraham completely, completely was followed through, and God did make Abraham blessed, 
and he did bless him. And all the nations were blessed in him. That's the way God works. Why did then God bring in the law? If his covenant promise with Abraham through Christ is fulfilled in faith. Why in the world did God do this? I mean, are you causing confusion here, God? Is there a contradiction in your word? Why in the world would you make the law significant? Why is it that we have the law? I mentioned last week in our message, in reference to the few verses, verse 10, 11, 12, 13 in the chapter, 14 down, that, hey, that law is a curse. And he's mentioning that and speaking that primarily, of course, to the Jew to start with, and then to the Gentile, the barbarian, and reminding them, hey, that, that law reveals to you your transgressions. So is that the only reason for the law? We'll have to answer that a little bit today in our text because, again, when I ask you this question, I want you to think about it. Why did God bring in the law if his covenant promise with Abraham through Christ is fulfilled by faith? Why the law? Well, you have some answers and you understand that, but remember what happened to Abraham as he looked forward. And, of course, it does mention in in our study uh, Hebrews chapter number 11, that he was looking for that far off country, another country. He's looking to the, the, the hope and the, and the prophecy and the promise of Jesus Christ because he knows. He knows. Remember, it's over 400 years. After that happens and that interaction and the covenant with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, that then we have Moses, the mediator, bringing the law to the nation of Israel. And so you say, wow. Did that count that way? Did God have to now add something to Abraham's faith to make him righteous? Again, Paul's answering those questions today because there are religious people that bring in contradictions and they want to take the word of God and mess with it a little bit. There's Judaizers in this text that are saying, okay, Christian, fine, but as a Judaizer, I love the law. I want the law to come back in. Remember, Romans teaches us, for by grace are you saved. In fact, it shows us that salvation is by faith. Galatians, its brother book, its sister book, its companion book, tells us that servanthood is by faith as well. So when we look at the text, the context of Galatians, the context of Romans, we realize that we can really get a lot of solid doctrine here to clear up what the word of God may seemingly have a contradiction when it really, really doesn't. You see, again, the covenant promise with Abraham through Christ is fulfilled by faith. Remember what it says in Romans chapter number four. Last week, we even highlighted a little bit of this. Verse number 20, 21, and 22. He staggered not, Abraham, at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. It continues in verse number 21. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. To impute something is just to exchange or put upon your account. And so God imputed righteousness. It was the promise of God that he would do that. And Abraham did not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and saying, I believe by faith in you, God, and you, God alone. Look at verse number 14 in Galatians chapter number three. It's just like a, just a reminder of this. Then we'll get into our text, but we'll get to there in a minute. Just hang in here for a minute. Verse 14 says from last week that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. When you get saved, when you're born again, the promise of the Spirit comes upon your life and now you're the vessel of the Holy Ghost, the Bible says. You're sealed to the day of redemption. It's a fulfillment of the promise of the word of God. And so that Holy Spirit of promise now in your life allows you to see the law in a different way. And we spoke of that last week. See, sometimes people think they can really keep the law in their own spirit, in their own flesh, in their own strength, and you can't. Ask Paul the Apostle. He knew it as well as anybody, and he wrote about it in the Holy Spirit. 
But the law sitting out there, you know how you can fulfill any of the law. To love your neighbor as yourself. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. To honor thy father and thy mother. You know why children have such a hard time doing that? Because most children are lost until they get saved and understand that the Holy Spirit that's come into them. You say, does that make a difference? Yes. You see a young child come to know the Lord. They're born again. The Holy Spirit of God's in them. You see and witness and understand something different. Now, on the other hand, a kid can just have good character qualities, and they're willing to do whatever it is to please their parents, and they honor naturally. But apart from salvation and the Holy Spirit of God in you, how do you really think you can keep the law? You can't. You cannot serve God and cause him to be so overwhelmed by your wonderful servanthood that he's going to pour out favor because somehow you earned it by the law. That's not what the book of Galatians is teaching us. It is by grace through faith that you serve the Lord, just as how you get saved, for by grace are you saved through faith. As it says again in verse number 14, Paul proved from the Old Testament that Abraham was justified by faith, not by law. But these Judaizers come along, and you know what they say? No, 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 no. I mentioned them earlier. They're the people that stand up in court and say, hey, you know what? It has to be the law. It must be the law. We need to add the law to earn God's favor. We need to serve God by his law. And that's the only way God's going to be pleased. And you know what the judge says once that statement is looked at and in that court setting is say, hey, I object. I object. I object to how you're saying it's by grace. I object to the faith of God. I object to how you can please God just by faith. And the judge says from that, ob objection, uh, that objection, it says, you're overruled. So that's the title of our message today, Objection Overruled. You see, the Judaizers, they objected to the faith. They objected to how Jesus Christ is the only way. They objected to, hey, you cannot please God that way by faith. And the defense attorney says, I object. Excuse me, the, the other side objects after they present their case, and the judge says, I overrule your objection. You see, Abraham and all his descendants prior to Sinai were saved by faith. Then the law comes in, and what you see then is, okay, what does the law do? Well, the, God, God, the law reveals the transgression of man. The law shows us that we cannot please God for salvation, and we truly cannot please God for our servanthood and for our service. Look at verse number 15 down through 29. Let's read through that now and get a handle on our text as we see that the objection is overruled, the objection to faith, the objection to the way that is faith and faith alone. And see in this context here in verse number 15 down that it is still by faith and it is through the law that we are proven to be guilty in the law, but also how the law does work in the passage, how the promise of God and the covenant that it works in the word of God, how the seed of the Lord Jesus Christ reveals to us that that's where we get our inheritance. Verse number 15, it says, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, Yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or added thereto. Think for a minute that there's a covenant, a contract. Two people, they make an agreement. They make an arrangement. And two people cannot break that covenant, break that contract, break that uh, agreement that they have pledged to one another. They just can't. It's a contract. You signed your name on the mortgage. Go ahead and break your covenant that you've made as a man, as a woman, and say, I don't feel like paying my mortgage. How do you think that's gonna go? Your signature is a binding part of that contract, it's the binding piece. 
Man sees covenant and sees it seriously. The contract, that agreement, that arrangement is by God, and you have to undo all of that. You have to undo that and change all the rules in order to annul that. God's truly saying something here, and watch this, because if man holds contract so serious, he holds covenant so serious, how serious do you think God holds the covenant? Verse number 16 says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. The seeds being the people, the heritage, but the one seed is Christ. Verse number 17, and this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Think about this again in, in the realization of what's being said and what I said earlier. God made a covenant. God made an agreement, an arrangement. He imputed righteousness upon Abraham. And then a few hundred years later, here comes the law. Does that mean now that God's going to undo his covenant with Abraham because he's brought the law? God forbid. No, he's not. There's another reason for the law. We have already pointed out some of it and will be reminded here in this passage what the law really, really does because God cannot disannul his own word. God cannot break his own covenant. It says in verse number 18, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore, then serveth the law. It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Uh, if you look at Acts 7, don't go there now, but you can put it in your notes. The writer pens about the angels and what they had to do as mediators to deliver the message of the law. Moses, he's the mediator between God and the nation of Israel with the law. You see, there is mediation or a mediator that was needed. But once Jesus Christ came, no more mediator needed. Look at verse 20. Now a media mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. As I said earlier, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, Verily, righteousness should have been by the law. When you read that verse, go to verse number 21 of the chapter before. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for it is if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. I wonder how that fits pretty nicely into your Bible. 3, 21, 2, 21. What is God saying? Very simply. If there had been a law given which could have given life, then all that Jesus Christ did was in vain. And the grace of God, the work of Christ, the finished work on the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection, it would be having to be added to by the law. In fact, it would be a disannulment through the law of what even Jesus Christ did. And the law did not disannul God's covenant that he made with Abraham. You see, as we continue through the text, watch this, how it lays out the last few verses. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto, faith, unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto having a self-righteous life. It's to bring us to Christ. To have a works-based life for salvation 
Or, no, we believe in the grace of God and the faith that we ought to exhibit in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, but after I'm saved, I'm going to bring the law back. And so it's not going to just bring me to a place where as a schoolmaster it brings me to Christ. But I'm going to cancel that out. And I'm going to be justified by my works and how I live my life. The very essence. The very essence of legalism. When you think about how this is laying out for you, you're reminded that at the last half of verse number 24, that we might be justified by faith. But after that, faith has come. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. Why do you put yourself under that schoolmaster constantly? In your flesh, dwelleth no good thing. But in the Holy Spirit there's fruit, fruit unto perfection. In the sanctification process of the Lord, there's beautiful things sitting out there for you and me, and it comes by faith and trusting in the word of God. It's so freeing to live in the liberty of Christ, but it's so binding to live in a place where we really believe we have to Earn God's favor in our service unto him. Verse 27, down the rest of the chapter. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's not the baptism that we saw here. That's a water baptism. That was a beautiful picture, as Pastor Bobby said, of what had already happened. Jessica had given her life to Christ, and he became her Savior and Lord. And then the Holy Spirit of God sunk in on top of her and immersed her in God. And then she was, as the word says, baptism equals immersion. And she was immersed into the Holy Spirit of God. That's the baptism of a believer. That's the baptism that makes all the difference for you to wonder whether you're saved or lost. If you sit there and you don't have a clue on what's going on, you're not sure whether you're saved or lost or up in the air, then that means the Holy Spirit of God is not living in you. And there's nothing you can do to generate that to happen. That's legalism. That's trying to find a way to force your salvation upon God. You can't earn your favor, earn his favor. You call in the name of the Lord to be saved. You believe in your heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Got too many people going to churches all day long that don't have the Holy Spirit of God in them because they've never been immersed in the Holy Spirit of God because they've never been saved. And so they come right along this passage of Scripture and go, huh, that's really confusing. Confusing, yes, to the loss is confusing because how is a Judaizer who says that they believe in Christ but want to go back and get a whole bunch of works to please God is ever, ever going to serve and love and fulfill their purpose. But churches for centuries have done that and you can find it right in the Bible. And so many of us followed that thinking process just like they did. The Judaizers did it for a long time because they wanted to undo the faith that we are to live in. We want to bring the law in. It says there, verse 27, for as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Christ is in you. Christ is on you. You have put off the old garments and you put on the new garments. Verse number 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. If you want to have an anti-division message in the world, preach right there. That's it. There's no worrisomeness in the body of Christ or there not ought to be. Because we're all one in Christ, everybody. Black, orange, green, purple. It doesn't matter what color. It doesn't matter if you're female or male or whatever. You are whether you're bond or free and belong to some master or not. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Hey, body of Christ, believers, that's the way we ought to live. It should be. And you don't have to scream and yell like I did. My ass set the baby. I'm with you. She's doing just fine. Or is it he? 
Well, three daughters, I know. I get them upset all the time. But you look at verse number 29 now. And if. And if. Ye be Christ. Then are ye Abraham's seed. Old Testament blessings come flowing through from all that Abraham is and has been. And we're also heirs in Jesus Christ, the Bible says. Paul's saying you're heirs according to your works and the law. No, we're heirs according to the promise. That's another one of those bonus things that happened when you gave your life to Christ. When you said... I believe in you, God, and what you've done to send your son. I believe in the name of the Son of God. Please, Father, forgive me. Please, God, forgive me. I just give my life to you. I'm turning from this wicked life of sin, and I'm going to turn to you. Do with my life what you may. Amen. And you get up from that moment, and you know from that moment, you don't even realize it, you are now Christ's. You are also Abraham's seed, and you are also heirs according to the promise. Do you know what kind of package you get when you get saved? Hallelujah. Woo! Everything that you and I don't deserve. It's powerful. So, I went a little further with the, with the thinking process here. Go ahead and advance it a little bit. V, down over to the fourth slide, third or fourth slide from there. I took this idea of objection and I said, okay, let me add something to it here. Objection overruled in favor of faith. You see, the objection to only faith has been overruled by faith. But it is faith. Yes, I know that. Then why do you and I get sucked back in? to living in a legalistic place where legalism drives us, where the idea that the law cannot change the promise is something that we push against, where we see that the law is not greater than the promise, yet we push against that. The law was not contrary to the promise, and we look at that and go, no, no, the law brings con. No, it doesn't. God is not contradicting himself. You see, the law was not given to provide life, the Bible says. The law was given to reveal sin. The law was given to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if a man honors the covenants between men or made by men, then how much more does God honor his covenant he's made with us in his word? He honors it completely. You see, salvation has always been provided through the perfect offering of Jesus Christ on the cross. Believers who lived before the cross and never knew specifics about Jesus Christ were nevertheless forgiven. And they were made right with God by faith in the anticipation of Jesus Christ's sacrifice. See, believers, I mentioned this earlier, whereas believers today, they're going, oh, let me look back to the cross. Wow. The cross has the final word. The cross is where it all happened. In the Judaizers, they say, what about the law? What about the law? Well, let me show you a couple things real quick for time. Just hang in there. Here we go. Three things that I see that really bring this passage alive for us, and I'll cover them quickly for time. The first one is that God's law, it has a complementary purpose. So it doesn't mean we're throwing it completely out, but it has a complementary purpose, not a substitutionary purpose. God's law is not to substitute for God's faith, uh, for faith in God, for, for grace are you saved through faith. You see, it's a complementary purpose. As I mentioned earlier, as the law was something that required a mediator for the Lord Jesus Christ, it's Jesus Christ and him alone. And you look at that and you say, okay, you said that a little bit ago, but just track me, help me again. Well, salvation's always been provided through the perfect offering of the Lord. Those looking to that promise, 
looking to that prophecy, looking to the Messiah coming, looking to the Lord Jesus Christ, the high priest, giving his life on the cross and shedding his blood and bringing that blood to the tabernacle offering in heaven. You see, legalists and legalism will always require that it needs a a, a new, a daily, uh, an every weekly mediator working. See, legalism promotes having to have your relationship bridged all the time. Whereas the liberty in Christ, when you get saved, you're in Christ, the Holy Spirit's already done the work. You just require him to be the intercessor. He intercedes for you. The meteor has to keep on doing the work over and over again, crucifying Jesus all over again, all over again, all over again. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life after salvation and you're, you're a new creature in Christ, then he's your intercessor and you require him to keep and en- enrich your relationship with God through the word of God. The law was not contrary to the promise. The law cannot change the promise. Verse number 19 up on the screen, wherefore then, just a reminder of these verses we've just read and how they fit. Wherefore then, serveth the law? Why? Wherefore, why? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Verse number 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So how is it again that you believe that going after that schoolmaster life is not a conflict and a contradiction to God's life that he has for you in Jesus to be sanctified, to live a life of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's that faith. You're free to live faith. Church, why is it that it's so easy to be pulled back into something like the schoolmaster, Because our faith is not pushing the law-abiding desire of the flesh away. And we need to allow the word of God to do that. That's what God does and that's what God desires when you and I realize that God's law is a complementary thing. It has a complementary purpose. It's not substituting the faith. Secondly, I see that God's promise has a permanent provision not a temporary provision. I mentioned verse number 21 here and verse number 21 in chapter two. I'm thinking God's promises, the way God lays out his promise here, a reminder of his covenant, it has a permanent provision. But you and I, we, we have a way of thinking, okay, well, I think maybe God forgot me. Maybe God's not there anymore. King David wrote about that. It's possible that because of your relationship or circumstances in life, it seems that way, but it's not true. God is still there. And he made a permanent provision through his promise. It wasn't something temporary that comes back and forth. You and I go back and forth. You and I waver and we quit and we give up. We say no. And I'm not talking about the big give ups where we say, hey, I'm just walking out on life. I'm talking about on a daily basis, not saying, okay, work in me, Lord. And then you sit there and wonder if he's going to work instead of opening up the word of God, looking at his word and saying, God, now work in me. Talk to me. Tell me some things. Remind me of your promise. Remember me that I have permanent provision in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remind me. Remind me constantly. Because guess what? That temporary provision that comes from the law only makes you feel good for a little while. The law could never, ever do what faith could do. The law can never ever do what the promise of God does to Abraham's seed, and that seed, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. If we are in Christ by faith, then we too are Abraham's seed, as we're gonna look at in a minute. But I, and not jumping ahead saying this, look at verse number 21 again, just to be reminded. Look, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. 
I'm fearful that so many believers still just live by this law-abiding life. Do a little, get a little, hope God's pleased. Do a little, get a little, do a little devotion, please. That's not the way God wants you and I to live. There's so much more out there for you and me. When's the last time that we as a church really got to a place where we said, hey, this is it. I want to live by faith. I want to get after it by faith. I want to say, hey, let me encourage my brothers and sisters by faith. And I keep on going. It says in verse number 22, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Woo. So now you're looking at that going, okay. The law was not given to provide life. No. But the law was given to reveal sin. Yes. And the law was given to prepare the way for almighty Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, which leads to the last one in the text here. God's seed has an inheritance power, not a condemnation power. You walk around feeling like you're condemned and you're, you're not doing enough for God and you're, and you're weary and you're heavy laden and, and you, oh my gosh, the life is so hard and, and you walk through this thing and you're doing this thing. Guess what? There's no power in that kind of life. See, God's seed has an inheritance power. The inheritance power is that in Jesus Christ, you are a joint heir. You are in him. You do have all that has been set in place in him. In Christ, by grace, through faith, you have salvation. But you have so much more. I have so much more. That's a beautiful place to live. The objection is overruled. As the Judaizers say, hey, you, you can't do it all by faith. You can't live by faith. You need to earn God's favor. No. It's been thrown out. The judge says, God's seed through the Lord Jesus Christ has given the believer inheritance power, and it's not condemnation power. You're not condemned. You're born again. You're saved, and you're a new creature in Christ. Verse 16, as we started out our reading, says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and two seeds, as of many, as we mentioned earlier, that physical, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. That's your inheritance. That's your life. You and I need to be reminded of that constantly. That's what keeps you breathing and walking spirit life instead of breathing and walking this fleshly carnal life that you're still trying to make God pleased with your life while you do the bare minimum or I do the bare minimum and I come up short and I feel like, wow, I just need to do something to serve God to make him better with me or I just can be better with him or somehow, just like the people that are lost, trying to make their way into heaven better by somehow earning their way. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 29, and finishing out things, and if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. As I finish this thought, I want you to just to finish in your mind and your thought the finished work of Jesus Christ. If ye be Christ, how do you know? You know. What if I'm not? Then you know. The moment I called on the name of the Lord to save me, I said it before, something really weird happened. It's weird. The burden was gone. I'd been set free. I didn't know that. My God, my Savior, what have you done for me? And completely free, so now... I belong to Christ. Then are ye Abraham's seed? Oh, God has been consistent all through the ages. And the law did not disannul that covenant. All it did was do its part to be that complementary piece, to reveal as our schoolmaster that in order to be heirs according to the promise, we needed to call on the name of the Lord to save us. If Paul the Apostle took this much time in the Word of God by the Holy Spirit of God, if the Holy Spirit of God put this much in here about this matter, you tell me it's not serious in the church. Because it's everywhere in your New Testament. The Colossian church at Colossae, they took Jesus Christ off the throne. 
put them in an awful lot of mess. The church at Corinth, oh my, they took the doctrines, they perverted them, and they went after their flesh. You can go on and on today to the people and the believers in Rome as well as others that received that letter, they needed to have their doctrine straightened out too because justification came by faith and God's righteousness was imputed upon the believer. And my fear is that after as a believer we fall into some ruts, we want to somehow earn everything back. Just look at this verse. If ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You have everything you need. It says here at the end in our last slide, believers are heirs of the spiritual blessings of God promised to Abraham, dot, 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 in Jesus Christ by faith. Everything, everything, everything is in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. The law, schoolmaster. Jesus, by faith, everything. Bow your heads for a word of prayer as we go into an invitation time. I want you to consider that statement as I pray for you. Is that where you're wrestling in your life? Maybe you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ completely for eternal life. You've never asked him to forgive you and called on the name of the Lord to save you. Or maybe you're here today and you're a believer and a lot of times law abiding becomes your way of life and you get totally frustrated and get to a point where you forget that you are Jesus Christ's. You are a joint heir with him. Maybe that's your invitation this morning. As we pray, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus and simply ask you, bless this time of prayer and invitation. I invite with my voice, but I know, Father God, in the name of Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, you're inviting others. Put us in a place where we would respond, but it is our choice and our free will. I pray that you receive the glory out of this next few moments. In Jesus' name, amen.